there's been a gradual redefinition of the role and nature of volunteering and volunteers, uh, from something that people did because they wanted to improve the environment, the wider aspects of volunteering have been, uh, been found, and, and I'll look at these a little bit later on. And there's been an evolution and a, a very rapid growth of what, what gets called gap year volunteering, and uh, international volunteering, and that is um, opportunities, particularly for younger people, to spend a year between college and work, or between school and university, to spend some time uh, seeing the world, finding out about the other things and themselves, um, and volunteering has become one way of doing that. That's become quite a big business, and it's it's caused quite a fast evolution in the way that volunteering uh, can be viewed by many people. <laughs> so, volunteering, environmental volunteering today in the UK, there are more smaller organisations trying to recruit and manage their own volunteers. From what was originally a few specialists, uh, now uh, a huge number of local organisations are recruiting their own, managing their own volunteers, and attempting to work with them. These include uh, local organisations, local NGOs, local uh, community organisations, uh, local government the countryside services, the environmental uh, parts of local, local government are running their own volunteer programs now. And, uh, and again, the local branches of, of the wildlife trusts. Um, so a lot of volunteering has a very local character about it. And some of the larger organizations that we were talking about earlier on uh, listed there have, fo have focused on on bigger programs, national programs with a national character, and some of that being um, program delivery on behalf of government. So uh, some of it back to work, the employment schemes for longer term un unemployment have become the focus of the larger organizations. This is something they can do nationally um, and continue to, to bring in the income, which is otherwise quite tight. And interestingly, today there's a much wider interpretation of, um, of environmental volunteering activities. So beyond the simple coming out and building a trail, or uh, environmental volunteering has now come to focus quite a lot more on urban green space management. So city parks um, and areas around where people live, the, the housing estates in cities that have green space around them, which is traditionally been the, the responsibility of government and local government, but perhaps hasn't been done terribly well and there's a lot less money. So now with volunteers and local communities getting involved in the quality of their own natural landscape around them, there's a lot more creativity. So what was once uh, a green field that uh, perhaps had quite a lot of rubbish in it, is now a community god. And these uh, ideas have often come from the community, the people that live there, and their own volunteering activities. Environmental volunteering is also focused a lot more on education, going out, speaking to people, talking about uh, the environment, about nature, and about nature management. And environmental volunteering has become involved with promoting healthy living, so food growing, which is a, a natural activity, which is something that everybody can get involved in, and it's something that everybody understands. We all need to eat. So volunteering in this kind of activity is expanded, uh, and it's, it's been seen as a way of involving more people in their own environmental management. And volunteering has been used to start to support research. Um, uh, the, the phrase of the moment is citizen science. 
scientists, researchers looking to find large-scale answers in or in many places are starting to look at how volunteers can be involved in helping to gather that information and contribute to, to nationally useful uh, research. And as well as a wider interpretation of environmental volunteering activities, there's been a, a wider interpretation of environmental volunteering purpose. Volunteering is seen as a way of improving community cohesion. It's a, it's a bit of a technical phrase uh, through shared activity. But basically, that, that means the strengthening of, of communities through shared uh, and relevant ex experience. Um, volunteering provides a way of getting people involved and working together and opening up uh, dialogue and, and, and relationships between these kinds of people. And this is particularly important in areas with, uh, as we have in the UK, with large uh, immigrant populations or multicultural populations where getting communities integrating and working together and being together is important and avoids a lot of uh, potential social issues and problems. And so volunteering, doing something together about the area that you live in, your own environment, is a very valuable way of doing that. The individual therapeutic benefits in, in terms of mental and physical health are being far more recognized uh, as one of the, the purposes of volunteering and one of the ways that we can, we can look at volunteering. And importantly, in this uh, funding climate, uh, another way that we can see the value of volunteering and therefore bring, bring in funding. So some volunteering programs are now funded by health authorities because of the value to the individuals involved rather than the value of the environmental work that's being done. The great thing is that through this process we're still getting the environmental value. Uh, the, the trails are still being built. And volunteering is uh, increasingly being seen as a, a form of corporate PR, so involving um, corporations and large companies in, in your work, your volunteering work as an organization can be quite value, valuable. It can bring in funding, it can also bring in people. And of course, we haven't quite forgotten about the idea that uh, through our environmental volunteering, we are improving the environment. or. Um, building trails, and we're still out there keeping that as our, as our final goal. So, working holidays. Working holidays have existed in the UK um, almost since the beginning of uh, the time of the Conservation Corps, because as soon as people enjoyed going out uh, discovered they enjoyed going out and spending a day in a nature reserve. They wanted to do it for a weekend and a week. So they got together and they, they all went off together. And, and so working holidays were born. It's now evolved a lot more. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that the key to this is the two words, working and holidays. The work is done, but also to make it successful, it has to be something that people are going to enjoy and as, a, as a form of tourism. And so into all these uh, working projects is mixed the idea of finding out more about the local area that you're in and um, uh, the cultural background to the area. But uh, interestingly, even recently, the tourism model has become even more widely developed outside of the UK. And I mentioned the evolution, very quick evolution of uh, gap year volunteering. So, and, and that's become volunteering for people going outside of the UK, maybe to Taiwan, something to consider. Um, and in parallel with this, this is interesting because it's been a great growth in, in working holidays. And yet within the UK, there has actually been a bit of a decline recently. 
And I think partly that's to do with the fact that the two, two businesses have worked in parallel, but not really talked to each other. Um, hopefully we're changing that now. But within the UK at the moment, there are three significant organizations which are, which are putting quite a lot of focus on working holidays. And they, they are really defining what the working holiday is in the UK. And hopefully now, uh, learning from the international experience further, the outbound volunteering uh, to improve that. The National Trusts and National Trust for Scotland, which I mentioned earlier on, big landowning organisation, a lot of interest in conservation and cultural conservation, historical things, but also uh, work with volunteers in a number of ways and run a very successful, uh, very successful working holiday programme. So I'll talk a little bit more about these organisations later on. An organisation uh, with whom my colleague Tony has done a lot of work, work with, particularly recently, uh, uh, Trees for Life, which focuses on reforesting, reforesting deforested areas of Scotland. And uh, our own organisation, Wild Days Conservation, which uh, specialises in volunteer management and works in partnership with other organisations. types of organisations, the types of organisations involved in um, environmental volunteering in the UK are quite varied. We have government through departments um, of various types actually, but uh, a range of departments including things such as uh, forestry department. Um, local government uh, is very involved in volunteering. Uh, on local nature reserves, they run their own um, ranger services, they have uh, responsibility for certain levels of nature, nature reserve and country park. Um, there are larger government agencies, national agencies such as uh, English Nature and the national park management bodies, all of whom are involved in volunteering. There are NGOs, many of them. Um, those that manage their own land for conservation, environmental benefit, the wildlife trusts, so the volunteer organisations that specialise uh, specialize in volunteer management, such as the conservation volunteers. And um, there are charitable trusts, funding organisations, which don't do anything directly themselves, but actively support the idea of volunteering. As the private sector is involved through um, uh, corporate partnerships with NGOs, uh, through some private landowners who, uh, who believe in uh, environmental management and conservation and do involve volunteers. Um, and there are social enterprises, which are private bodies with social goals. Um, and that includes ourselves, well, there's conservation. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, and I, and I keep saying it, that key to these kinds of, um, the value and the, benefit, the, the way that it works best, the way it's working so well in the UK is the partnership between organizations. There are not many good examples of somebody trying to run good volunteer programs and environmental management entirely on their own. It's partnerships between communities, between NGOs, between government, between private sector that, that works all the time. And it's partnerships which have three key factors to, it, to them. There's the need. There needs to be a need before anything useful is going to be done the trail construction, the need for land management, perhaps the need for uh, policy outcomes, uh, for corporate social responsibility, or the need for volunteers. One of the partners, or some of the partners in anything, is going to need to meet that, or is going to have that need. 
There's the expertise, uh, the volunteer management skills, which uh, I'm now very confident that there's a lot of expertise in this country for. Um, management skills, uh, the technical expertise or the ecological expertise. And there's the funding. Everything costs money. It's got to come from somewhere. Uh, funding might be for core costs, which is the, the underlying costs of an organization. Uh, it could be for project costs, very specific uh, to, an, to a specific project, or, um, or sponsorship, yeah, which might be defined in a relationship between a corporate body and an NGO. Uh, but in any relationship, uh, these, these roles could be shared, uh, they could be, several roles could be taken by one organization, um, or several organizations could contribute to one of the roles. The, the important thing is that they're all met within a partnership and that it should be clear um, what, how that partnership is going to work and who's bringing which role to them. Uh, I'll show you some examples. First is an example of a uh, partnership between government in the, in the form of national park management body, and these are quite large areas of government actually, the national parks. They're big in the UK, um, but importantly and unusually, they're not all owned, the, the national parks are not all government owned land, it's all pretty much all private land. Um, with a designation on top of it. So the role of a government in, in a national park is as uh, almost a planning authority uh, which controls how land can be used in an area. So they have, they have quite a big and complex role in the, in the national parks and it's not as simple as just owning it and doing what they want. And in this uh, example, uh, um, partnership, we have an NGO, uh, the Conservation Volunteers. That was the organization that was originally the Conservation Corps. In this partnership, we have the NGO, which recruits and manages volunteers to carry out essential uh, repairs to long distance footpath network, uh, where it passes through the National Park. And although the work, as I explained, is on private land, the National Park Authority has an interest in this trail being developed and has negotiated the access and, the, and identified the need for that work. Uh, the National Park Authority itself doesn't have volunteers and it, can't, it, it doesn't manage volunteers and so TCV as the NGO partner is providing that, and that role uh, and also the expertise, the technical expertise in building, building the trail. Another very different example of an NGO and private sector operating together. In this case, one of the local wildlife trusts, um, the one where I live, as it happens, and a private sector company called Eco Sustainable Solutions Limited. In this case, the private company becomes a member of the Wildlife Trust's corporate membership scheme. And uh, in return for this, uh, they can promote their membership. They have a, an association with a, a good NGO. This company has an interest in, in being seen to be environmentally aware and, and, uh, um, and socially responsible. So it's of value to them to be able to associate them with the organization. In return, they're not just giving money, though. They're contributing um, expertise, but also um, they're contributing people. So they, they can actually bring out some of their staff to work, to, to volunteer directly with the Wildlife Trust to, to actively um, do the nature reserve management and contribute to work in that way. This, of course, has other benefits for the corporate organization because it's an excellent form of um, team building and, and corporate bonding uh, in the workplace. It's also good fun for the employees. In this case, the NGO has the need. It needs to manage its nature reserves. 
it needs funding. Uh, and, but it also has the expertise to get the, uh, to get the uh, employees actively involved. The company is providing funding, always very important, but also has a need, a need for association with, uh, with environmental awareness. And a third example, this time again, uh, a government partner and social enterprise. In this case, through a country park, um, which is different from a national park. It's, a, it's still a large uh, area managed for environmental benefit, but it's managed by a local government unit. And Wild Days Conservation, our own organization. This is an example of how we work with local government. Uh, we work in the national park, we bring volunteers, and we organize working holidays to work in that national park, a uh, country park. Um, volunteers are involved in the restoration of traditional landscape features, some of these walls that I talked about, um, trails within the park, and uh, in managing habitat, so in fact removing invasive species. Um, Wild Days Conservation, the, the social enterprise, recruits the volunteers, paying volunteers, package the experience up into a, a holiday which, is going to, which the volunteers would like, and uh, bring them to work in the park. Both the partners, in this case, provide expertise um, in the form of technical expertise and the ecological expertise, and we share that role in supporting the volunteers in their work. So, all this uh, organisational and partnership talk sometimes seems a bit dry, and um, because particularly for many of us, our our origins are in the practical work, and we we like volunteering, we like getting out there, and sometimes we're not always that comfortable standing in a suit in front of everybody. But. Um, So, time to say a few words about working holidays and the, the kind of ways that we run working holidays in the UK. And from what I've seen here, from what I've heard here already, there are a lot of similarities, um, which, is, which has been great to see. The way that uh, holidays are made, constructed in the background to them, and of course then the people that they attract and how they, how they work well. They are, of course, uh, it's practical environmental work. I have said that we go beyond uh, just trail building, um, but certainly include that. Uh, and the key to them is, of course, that they're packaged up into something which is, which is fun. It's going to be fun, people are going to enjoy it, and if they get something out of it personally, they're going to contribute to it and uh, create uh, something which is going to be useful. As tourism, they certainly capitalize on and benefit from some of these things. The attractive surroundings is usually going to be in a nice place. Some of the high mountain areas or nature reserves or the valuable wildlife areas. Um, some of the volunteering activities I talked about in urban areas are possibly not so, um, not so attractive and therefore less suitable for working holidays. But perhaps for another kind of volunteering. They capitalize on the fact that volunteers are learning skills. You come on a holiday, by the time you go home, you're going to have learned something new and something potentially valuable uh, in the future. Social opportunities. It's a great way of meeting people. Um, meeting people who you spend some time with and then possibly will get to know better and get to know longer. So many friendships and, um, and more have been made uh, through working holidays. There are health benefits. I talked about how organizations are starting to, to capitalize on the value of that for funding, but of course for individuals, 
a week, a week working, building a trail is, is a fantastic way of getting fit, staying fit, and, and improving your own uh, mind and body. And there's cultural learning. There's the opportunity to travel to other places to find out about those areas. And it's a very good way of doing it, more than being a tourist and being pushed into the, the tourist resort or the places that, that you're supposed to go as a tourist. Through this, these kinds of holidays, it's possible to get an insight into an area and meet people that you wouldn't normally as a tourist. It's, uh, it can be, can be a unique way of traveling. So just a summary of the, uh, the, the kind of the, the key features of the holidays. They can be from two, two days as a holiday to two weeks. Um, they tend to involve about seven hours work a day, um, usually with, uh, with days off. They're groups. They involve groups. And this is a, this is important, a key part of it. It's, uh, valuable obviously we get more done working as a team but it's it's valuable for the people involved uh, and it's it's an interesting learning experience for everybody and groups tend to get involved in all aspects from the work the catering uh, some of the, the domestic activities just the activities around living somewhere together and social activities together um, so this group aspect is, is key to it. Volunteers on working holidays range from the age 16 to 80 and, and beyond. Um, there are some amazing volunteers who have been volunteering with these organizations since pretty much the beginning and are still involved. In the UK, there's a fairly even split between male and female. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem to be something which just favours one group over the other, which is good. And uh, holidays occur over a wide range of conditions, from very basic um, camping in, in wild areas to, to, to the very comfortable and luxurious. So there is something for everybody, um, and different organisations specialise in different ways in these. Uh, I'll say a little bit more now and, uh, about the three main organizations I mentioned earlier on and, and how they work, because each is different. A National Trust uh, and National Trust in Scotland, uh, they're national NGOs, they're very big. Uh, and they, they have huge land ownership, they have uh, huge responsibilities. Um, uh, and, uh, and a lot of history. Yeah. Um, they were founded 1895, um, and they've been adding to their role and their portfolio of buildings and land ever since then, and the huge range of activities that they're involved in. They protect historic and significantly important national assets, including buildings, and natural landscapes. But importantly, they run quite a large working holidays program, have done for quite a long time. So they're running 130 or more holidays every year. And these are mainly weekend or long weekends. So by long weekend, I mean four days, Friday to Monday. And, uh, and some week long working holidays. They tend to be fairly basic and fairly uh, cheap so that uh, they're accessible to quite a large number of people so they, they attract quite a range of different people uh, from students through to uh, older enthusiasts. A second organization which which has the most, uh, which, it, which significantly runs um, working holiday programs is Trees for Life. And this is the, 
This is an organization which is solely based in Scotland, uh, the north of Scotland, and has a very, um, very fixed focus on woodland restoration in the Scottish Highlands. And their aim really is to, is to restore some of the uh, ancient woodlands of Scotland. Um, so a lot of their work is in replanting uh, or seed collecting, growing up trees, and then replanting. Um, so it's quite an interesting area, quite an interesting area of focus, and it it shows some of the the extent and the, the value that can be got out of environmental volunteering as well. Uh, they're they were founded in 1989. They've been celebrating 25 years recently. They run about 35 projects, week-long projects every year, holidays. Um, all to a fairly straightforward single week model, and they they have a fairly again fairly basic uh, conditions for people to, to live in. So again, it's quite an economical way for people to go on holiday. And the final. The third organization in the UK, and it's sometimes hard to believe there really are only three organizations that are doing this kind of activity at a, a, a national level or a, on a large enough scale. Uh, the third is our own Wild Days Conservation, and um, we actually, we were formed because the organization, the conservation volunteers that used to run working holidays stopped doing them, and we we thought there was a there was more to be done, the, the, and, and the experience we had seen from international volunteering uh, told us that perhaps the UK had more to learn from uh, the organisations which were taking things out of the way. So we set out to uh, to reinvent the working holiday in the UK and try and revitalise the, the the business. So we operate across the UK. Um, we're a social enterprise, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on. Uh, we were founded in 2012, uh, and we've been very busy since then. We work, as I said before, in partnership with public, private sector and NGO organisations, so we don't operate independently in any way. We build partnerships wherever we go. We specialise exclusively in working holidays, uh, so unlike um, for instance, the National Trust, which has property ownership and all kinds of other things, we focus entirely on, on the working holidays. And uh, we combine, and we're the only organization to do this, we combine research, uh, wildlife research, with practical conservation management. Um, Finally, I'll just say a few words because I've, I've mentioned um, volunteering organisations and outbound, uh, volunteers going out of the UK to work in other countries, and, and that this is actually quite a significant part of the business which isn't really seen in the UK. Um, it's grown rapidly over the last 10 years uh, as a form of tourism. There's a range in this case of NGO and private sector organizations which get involved and a, and a variety of ways that they operate this. Some have evolved out of tourism organizations and some have evolved out of uh, environmental management organizations and they've managed to meet in the middle in various different ways. So some organizations um, Uh, actually initiate the program projects, the working projects, the environmental project. They, uh, they manage the project on the ground and they recruit the volunteers and they, they take um, a part in the, 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 whole, the whole thing. Some are organizations that just recruit volunteers and give them some support from the UK and then send them to work with other organizations outside the UK. And some of them, some of them uh, really just recruit volunteers. So they, they, uh, they do the marketing, they have the website, they, 
take the money and they hand the send the volunteers overseas to go and work with another organization. Um, it can be hard to tell which is which sometimes. Of course, they have a global reach. They work, these organizations can work anywhere, in the, anywhere around the world. Some specialize in some areas, some will work anywhere. But strangely, none of them work in the UK. So, and this, this uh, perhaps contributes to this parallel evolution of, of working holidays inside the UK and working holidays outside the UK. There hasn't been any crossover. So a few, just a little more detail about the, the UK range and variety of, um, of uh, holidays. Talked a little bit about the periods that they run for. Everything from weekends, holidays, long weekends, weeks, two weeks, perhaps in, um, in more remote areas, and, uh, and longer, occasionally and rarely. Um, generally outside the UK if they're doing that, or occasionally in the, in the remote areas of, uh, of the UK, so perhaps the islands. And the range and variety of activities. I mentioned uh, we go beyond uh, trail, trail building. So uh, working holidays are involved with wildlife nature management. Examples would be uh, clearing invasive plants, Um, the removal of uh, yeah, so clearing invasive plants, uh, tree planting, and so on. But we are still involved in what we call access management. That is, getting people into the countryside. That includes the, the trail building, um, but also also includes nature reserve infrastructure. The the signs, the uh, fences, the gates, and the, and the various things that are needed in nature reserves. Uh, getting people into nature is, is an important thing. Uh, doing it safely in a way that they can enjoy it, uh, they can get the most out of it without running too much risk, and without damaging the, the, the nature and the environmental area um, is important. And so this and this kind of work is and will always continue to be a very valuable and important part of the work that volunteers are doing. And research. I said that Wild Days Conservation is the only organization in the UK to be combining research and practical management. We, we're involved with wildlife survey, with monitoring. Other organizations do get involved with these kinds of survey and monitoring as well, but they tend to specialize in that, and that only. Um, so there is a range of, of activities that the volunteers are getting involved with through the holidays. And there's a range of uh, places that people are getting involved in, that working holidays take part in. There's the remote areas, uh, the national parks, uh, and Scotland, which is, uh, has large remote areas in it. Not easy to visit unless you, you're there for a few days, and so working holiday is a perfect way to do that. Publicly owned nature reserves, um, run by local government, often very beautiful parts of the countryside, and a great place to host holidays and have holidays working. And I mentioned urban and semi-urban areas. Occasionally, working holidays have happened in these areas. It is the case that an attractive natural environment is, is obviously a good place to be running a working holiday. Um, it's important. And so obviously, urban areas can be less attractive. but where we have successfully run holidays, where um, urban areas 
um, offer other opportunities to add to the, the tourism part of the, the holiday. So the opportunity to spend a day off away from the environmental work that you're doing and spend some time in the city uh, can be an interesting cultural experience and so can be included in working holidays. So not always remote and in wild, wild areas. So I've given you a summary of the situation with environmental volunteering in the UK. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very quick overview. Uh, I, I'm going to now just look forward a little bit to look at one organization and give you a case study of, and give you some more detail of our own organization, Wild Days Conservation. Um, uh, I would say this because it's our own organization, but if we are currently involved in pioneering a, a new model for working holidays in the UK, uh, which has learned from the kind of experience I've been talking about and has learned from the international volunteering. So we explicitly set out to combine the practical environmental work that we talked about with, uh, with research, wildlife research, um, which is very common outside the UK, uh, where volunteers are going and they're um, able to see the kind of wildlife, the big exciting wildlife that uh, in the UK we only ever see on our TVs. Um, so the idea has been, has been invented. Now, the problem in the UK, of course, is that most of our wildlife is quite small and, and or very hard to see. So we set out to try and make some of the small and hard to see things attractive as a, as a holiday. But our main aims, underlying aims, are to bring, as, a, as an organization, is to bring more resources in terms of manpower, of people, and funding to high value wildlife conservation in the UK. And in conjunction, to bring in a new and interested and motivated audience into wildlife conservation in the UK. So new people, the kind of people that previously haven't been involved in uh, conservation and environmental organizations and in volunteering. So we're trying to get different kinds of new people into, into volunteering. That's what we want to do, but what do the volunteers want to do? Because if we can't meet what it is that they want to do, then nobody's going to, we're not going to achieve anything. So we spend a lot of time um, thinking about and focusing on what it is that volunteers want to do. And these kind of questions have formed the, the heart of a lot of the work we've been doing here in Taiwan for the last couple of weeks, is looking at what it is that volunteers get out of it, what it is that they want to put into it, and what their motivations are. Because if we, can, if we know about that, we can, um, we can help them to become uh, productive and enjoy their experience. Our volunteers, they want to know about, they want to, they want to learning and experience. And experience. They, they, want to, they want to get something new out of it. They want to make a difference. They have an interest. They have an interest in the environment. Uh, they want to improve it. Um, they're interested in um, physical activity. They want to do something to help themselves get fitter. They want to meet people. And the one thing never to forget 
is that everybody wants to have fun. If we can make people have fun, then they're going to like what they're doing and they're going to engage with what we're trying to do. If we can't meet these aims as an organization, then we're not going to be successful. We always need to remember these things while we're focusing on the, uh, on the trails that we're building or the wildlife that we're surveying or the trees that we're planting. Now I'm not sure what that says. <laughs> but it started at the bottom. <laughs> so I'll give you the rest. Um, as an organization, we were founded, founded in 2012. So we're, 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 the new, we're the new kids on the block. We're, we're stirring up things from, from, uh, from the beginning. Our origins lie in the Conservation Volunteers, as I said, which is a, a large NGO which specializes in volunteer management and, and environmental practical conservation. That's the digging and the trail building and the getting muddy. Um, and the other side of our origins is with, um, it's in an organization called Biosphere Expeditions, which specializes in uh, research, wildlife research, working with scientists, providing the manpower through volunteering to, to gather uh, valuable scientific data. So we were ideally set up to, to build this new model. We focus almost entirely on working holidays, so we don't try and get involved in other kinds of volunteering. We, we want to specialize in this. There are two directors. It's a very slim organization. Uh, and we work with a team, team, we manage a team of contracted, self-employed leaders and experts. So we can bring in the experts, the, the specialists that we need, and the specialist leaders that we need as we need them. We, in setting out to do this, we've combined some novel approaches new ideas um, with the traditional models. The new, the new ideas, as I've said, are combining practical action with research, a focus on quality and comfort in terms of food and accommodation, etc. Working holidays in the UK have always traditionally been a very basic thing because they were for, for the tough people who wanted to go out and do something, um, and they were putting. They were. That, that's a good thing. That got a lot of people involved. They were relatively affordable, so as many people as possible could get involved. But they were actually putting off a lot of people as well. So there were people who didn't want to be doing that. People that uh, didn't want to come home after a day's work and then uh, spend their time chopping vegetables, and cooking food for each other. Uh, and then living in, in fairly rough conditions, sharing, sharing, sleeping on the floor. So uh, our aim in bringing in some new people and also the kind of people that might uh, get quite involved, more involved in, in the work of our partners was to focus on this comfort, uh, more, more comfort, focus on high quality food, local food, the best that uh, local areas can offer. And we have a social enterprise structure. I've mentioned this, but I haven't really explained too much more about it. We will look a little bit more about at, at some of these novel approaches later. Um, unusually for um, a working holiday, organization running working holidays, we, we are entirely funded by the participants, the people that are coming on the holidays. And that might sound surprising. Uh, it, it may be, you think, well, why aren't participants paying for these things? But in many cases, they have these models, funding, the funding models involve subsidizing working holidays. However, we're still running the same thing in the end. It's still a working holiday. 
we're getting the work done, we're doing the work on the ground, and people are learning and getting a lot out of it as a holiday. And we still focus an awful lot on the value and the important role of the leadership. And, uh, and it's this that we've been talking a lot about with our trainees over the last couple of weeks. Um, and, uh, and it's still very important to us. So a little bit how we uh, how we deal with these uh, these new approaches. The practical action is very familiar. It's the same kind of work that that uh, working holidays have been doing uh, and do here in, in Taiwan. We work exclusively though in partnership with other organisations, so the conservation land managing organisations, local government, NGOs, these people that we were talking about earlier. And the activities are just the same. The, the tree planting, the invasive species removal, the, the traditional landscape features, dry stone walls, and, the, uh, and trail building. The research that we do get involved in. We specialize in uh, small mammal survey. Um, I'm sure, as here as everywhere, there are um, under our noses all the time a lot, of, uh, a lot of wildlife that we rarely see. And although it's common, we know remarkably little about. Um, we have the advantage as an organization which works nationally with a lot of people in different places to be able to help to build up more of a picture of mammal and small animal species. So we have formed a partnership with a national NGO, uh, the Mammal Society, and we are contributing across the UK to their research to contribute to uh, the formation of a, of a national mammal atlas, which is really first uh, complete survey of mammals in the UK. It still hasn't been done up until now. Uh, it's an important piece of work. So our research focus is on this. And this, is, this turns out to be something that volunteers really love doing. The picture here is of a wood mouse, which is an extremely common small mouse in the UK, but many people have never seen one. They're, they really are almost everywhere in the countryside. Um, you can hear them if you know what you're listening for, but many people have never seen them, one. So by coming on our working holidays, they get the opportunity to learn about, first of all, the small mammals and their conservation, but then uh, technical techniques for trapping and monitoring. Uh, we trap, we live trap um, small mammals, we, they set the traps, and the next morning they can get up and, and, and see what's being caught. These mice are found in the traps, they're checked, they're weighed, information is collected about them, it's written down and recorded, and then they're released. Um, that data, the volunteers then uh, submit to national databases and immediately it's, uh, it's contributing to, to this national picture. Um, it turns out that volunteers really love doing this. They've never, they've never even seen these mice before. Now they're learning to handle, uh, handle wildlife, to, to learn something about it. Um, and um, this, this is proving to be a, a very attractive experience. Uh, in this particular case, the person there, that was his first time doing that, and he's now gone on to, to contribute much more, to go on and, and survey wildlife beyond. I talked a bit about our focus on 
quality and comfort, something uh, which um, possibly some people in the room would go, hmm, that's, that's better than, uh, than camping. I'd like to do that. Um, comfortable accommodation, interesting local restaurants and good food. Um, and then the input from professionals into the sort of learning experiences. So in the evenings, we can have talks from uh, experts in, in wildlife. The target here is, is a sort of educated professionals. We're trying to attract these people back into volunteering. And the benefit, of course, is it brings a new source of potential funding and a different kind of people uh, that start engaging with the, the wildlife organizations that we partner with. So it's bringing different people back into volunteering, back into uh, actively getting involved with, it, with the environmental management. The other innovation is perhaps a bit of a, a technicality but uh, we, have a, we have what we call a social enterprise structure. We're not an NGO. We're, not, we're actually a private company, but we have defined social objectives. And this is quite a new, a new structure in the UK. The idea is that although privately owned, we have a very strict purpose and, and we stick to that. And there are a few technical things. There's restrictions on profit distribution. Any profits are, uh, are ploughed back, go back into the organization to help, help us achieve our aims. Um, and we have specific things we would do if the, we would have to do if the organization wound up. Uh, and for these reasons, it, it is actually, it, it feels like uh, an NGO structure, um, but it has a lot more flexibility. Um, we don't work with boards and trustees and so on. Disadvantage is that it actually limits some of the external funding that we might have available to us, which would only be available to NGOs. But, uh, as we said, we are participant funded. Our aim is to fund ourselves entirely from the people, the working holiday people, and we're not going out to seek funding from, other, from elsewhere. And part of the reason we don't want to be seeking funding um, we have it that is because we want to retain our independence. We don't want to be too uh, tied by the funding that we would receive, which is something that can happen with NGOs, for sure. Um, by being entirely participant funded as well, in other words, all the money that comes in from the people that are coming on the working holidays is all that we have. Um, it does mean that unlike in the NGO model that we've seen previously, uh, it has been possible to criticize, the possible criticism has been that money that was given to the NGO for charitable reasons has finished up subsidizing other people's holiday experiences. And, and this has been a, a criticism. Uh, for us, we want, if people are coming involved, the idea is that they are paying for what they're getting. And all the money coming in then is new funding coming into conservation and environmental management. It's our job to make that work, to make the holidays attractive. Uh, the other reason is that it removes the distraction of fundraising. Fundraising is uh, nearly a full-time job for many NGOs. They work hard all the time and it's very competitive. Uh, having worked in NGOs a large part of my life, I must say it's a real pleasure not to be fundraising all the time. Um, and the final point, um, in English I wrote this as it avoids uh, fundraising driven mission creep. And what I mean by that is that um, 
we can keep our focus on the organization's core goals and aims without uh, being distracted or, or going somewhere else in a slightly different direction because there's funding available to do that. Uh, this is, this is a, a danger, I think, in some, for some NGOs that there's funding available to do something slightly different and so they tend to move in a slightly different direction. So, I'm not going to say, any, say much more now. I hope I've given you a, a good summary of the uh, environmental volunteering and working holiday sector in the UK, how that works, and of course, an example of how I hope uh, it's also going to evolve. Um, the private sector, in terms of social, uh, the social um, enterprise in volunteering in the UK is quite new. And um, it's something that takes a bit of getting used to. There's a lot of preconceptions about how volunteering is something that is done by NGOs and not private sector. Um, but we think, I think there's a, there is a future for it. Uh, we're able to operate in a very lean and efficient manner and, um, and not get so distracted by other things, which is very well suited to working holidays. Working holidays has a lot to learn from uh, the private sector and tourism management. And I think uh, as environmental people, environmental managers, we've got a lot to learn from tourism and private sector as well. Uh, but throughout all of that, uh, the real key to successful environmental management with volunteers, uh, as I keep saying, is in the partnerships. I don't think anybody is doing it successfully on their own. And I think the partnerships, the strength of the partnerships between NGO, between private sector, and between government is, is the key to making these things work. And so it's great to be in this room with the uh, Taiwan Forest Bureau and with the with a, a strong NGO and seeing how that partnership is developing because I think that's that's a, a, a strong indicator for the future here. So I'll just finish up now and leave you with a, a few words from some of the people that uh, have come and got involved in our working holidays and uh, hopefully some of you would recognize this kind of uh, feeling and sense from your own volunteering or from your own volunteers. Um, and finally, to uh, warmly invite anybody who finds themselves in the UK, visiting the UK, and would like to do it in a slightly different way, would like to uh, gain an insight that you're not going to get from normal tourism, and uh, welcome you to come and join us on a Wild Days Conservation Holiday sometime. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank you and Andy for a very uh, outstanding speech. Also, a uh, very detailed <coughs> describe all the uh, their new model of social enterprise structure about the WDC. Uh, I想我刚刚做了一点笔记哦，他的演讲非常的精彩。他事实上在跟我们分享，就是说除了呃NGO以外，有没有什么样的模式啊，是由企业来经营，但是他的。目的跟目标还是从保育、从公益这样来着手。那他们的组织才成立两年，也只有两个director哦，他都是一个非常瘦身的组织。可他贡献非常的多。那当然，不同的model是说不能够违背原来的的理想跟理念哦。然后他们也
对于社交、对于健康，甚至呢，我想在林务局很多的外来种移除，说不定未来这些志工的圈里也可以做这样的事情啊。因为呃，我们还有一点时间到十二点。那我们也欢迎呃在座的老师们，或者是专家或呃有兴趣的人可以提问。我们每一位给两分钟，然后请你哎对嗯说明你自己是名字跟单位好不好？我们先开放，有没有朋友要请教呃 Andy 或在座的呃伙伴们的？这很难的机会，我想这个。他的组织，包括他们这几天的工作，哦，他的训练，我觉得都是很多的 know how 在这里面。各位，好，这边有一位，呃，你好，有个呃，跟步道可能有点相关的问题，想请问一下，那个我是来自台北市出去晚晴，那个就是呃，他在执行工作步道，这些在山林中的步道，他有时候会有所谓的基地营的部分。那想问的是说，说这些基地营是不是其实也就是一些山屋，或者是一些工作的一些。